Hey, Pioneers, welcome to episode number 391. Today's episode is a special one, and I have a very special guest actually back for the second time. So I'm really excited about this guest, and you'll see why in just a minute when we end up bringing him on. But on today's episode, we're going to be talking about mRNA vaccines and not COVID-related vaccines, mRNA vaccine in humans, but mRNA vaccinations in meat, specifically in livestock that is intended for meat and for human consumption. And there's been a lot recently, you've probably seen floating around uh, social media, a lot of talk about this in the last month. There's some legislation that's actually coming up in some of the states regarding this. And as with anything, you'll see a lot of both sides being presented, right? And it takes some diving into and getting to the heart and truth of the matter as best as we can, because you'll see in this interview where there's a lot of things that are being said that are more half-truths, right? And so interpreting those and deciding what is right for you and your family. So that was the first part of the discussion, but regardless of what your stance or thoughts might be on mRNA technology in vaccines, it actually is a very good time for homesteaders and having choices for people when it comes to their meat via raising it themselves or seeking out small farms and homesteads to be able to purchase meat from them directly instead of from um, a large place where you don't actually know how that animal is being treated, the meat that you're buying, uh, what maybe it has been used or hasn't been used it as far as its healthcare goes. And so we've got some excellent tips. In fact, you will see me rapidly taking notes. And I had a huge aha moment in the way that we will be offering our grass-fed, grass-finished beef locally to our customers. I So I'll just tell you who's today's guest is. It is Joel Salatin. And I always learn something from Joel. Every single time I have had the pleasure of speaking to him, either here on the podcast or listening to one of his talks or being at one of his presentations, I always come away with something. So I'm really excited to be able to have this discussion. I think it's an important discussion for us to have. And Joel and I also tell some stories on raising cattle and different things that, that we have seen over our lifetimes of raising cattle. So really, really great episode. And if you are looking to be able to sell a couple extra, maybe pigs, right? If you're raising pigs for your family and you have a couple extra you want to be able to sell or cattle, etc. Oh, my friends, you are going to love the second half of today's interview. So if you are listening to this, I'm like the old fashioned way as you would in a podcast app and not which, watching the video version, which we are now doing a video version and releasing that on YouTube. So welcome if you are newer to the podcast via our YouTube video sessions. But if you are my, my old fashioned peeps who have been with the podcast Oh my, this is episode obviously 100, 391, almost 400 episodes. So we have had the podcast for a very, very long time. We always have a blog post that has all of the links, a written transcript in a written format of the episode. So you can find that at melissaknorris.com forward slash 391 just the number 391, because this is episode number 391. So we will have some links to there because you will hear in this episode with Joel, where we are talking about people deciding how to decide, especially if they've never done it before and have no idea what cuts of meat to even tell the butcher that they want. I have a very detailed blog post on that, um, actually a part one and part two to ensure that you get all parts of the animal when you are buying it directly from a farmer and walking you through how to know what to put on a cut and wrap order. So make sure that you check that out. We'll have that at that forward slash 391 in the uh, episode show notes and blog post. So without further ado, we will bring on the interview and bring on Joel. Well, Joel, welcome back to the Pioneering Today podcast. Thank you, Melissa. It's great. Always a delight to be with you. Same. I have to say, I was quite excited when I checked my calendar this morning and saw our talk was on here. I've been looking forward to it all morning, even as I was chasing cows, knowing that we were going to be talking about cows today. Sure. Yeah. So one of the things that I've been seeing a lot of lately, 
and I know you have done some episodes on your podcast as well on this is mRNA vaccines when it comes to animals. Mm -hmm. And is it something that is already in the food production system? Because that seems to be one of the things you see a lot of back and forth on. No, it isn't. And others, well, maybe it is. Um, So kind of just walking a, a little bit briefly through that, especially for folks who might not have heard any of this or missed all of the the social media sharing and and sure. rising up of this. Um, so if you want to just start us out a little bit with the mRNA vaccines, specifically in poor livestock, um, mm-hmm. and then of course, how that translates into our food supply. Right, right. So um, like most people, I'd never heard, hey, Melissa, you ever heard of mRNA before COVID? No, I hadn't. No. No. All right. It's completely All new right. term to me. So, so, so I'm in the same boat. So, so most of us thought, including me, as naive as you know we are, um, mo- uh, thought that, that, that this mRNA thing really developed in 2020 when Trump fast paced the, you know, that technology for COVID and, and we all heard about mRNA. This is a new dramatic thing and da da da. Well, it turns out, that the industry, that the livestock industry has been in this game for a long, long time. This was not new technology. It was new for humans, but it was not really new for, for the basic for animals or, or even um, uh, mammals. And so it, it so um, probably this story really broke from Joe, Joe Mer- Dr. Joe Mercola. Uh, he, he, he broke it about a month ago. And uh, and it's now really gained momentum, and it's been corroborated now. Uh, right now, Missouri uh, has uh, a, a House bill right now in the legislature to uh, to prohibit unlabeled mRNA um, food from the uh, from the t- without a label. And and in the testimony, uh, different, especially cattlemen, have testified. What, what what the the testimony has has brought out is that the livestock industry has been using this for a long time. Uh, so the so the poultry industry began using it about 2012, and the pork industry began using it about 2015, and the livestock and the cattle industry began using it about uh, two years ago. Okay, now the National Cattlemen Beef Association (NCBA), of course, they vehemently they've come out with a press release. There are no licensed, you know, mRNA things, right? I saw but that. Is, but but Melissa, this is this is typical clever speak. That she, he they are correct. There is no FDA licensed mRNA. Um, I I don't even like to call them vaccines. They're they're gene therapy, and everybody's trying to you know figure out what to call them. They're, they're not the old traditional vaccines with live serum and all that stuff. Um, they're, they're a gene, a, a gene therapy manipulation. Uh, and, and so there are numerous categories, um, categories of use preceding a license. So there is a trial category, an emergency category. That's what, it, that's what the COVID MRNA came in under. See, COVID mRNA has hasn't been licensed either, but it's under emergency an emergency category. Uh, there is a conditional uh, category, so there are numerous categories pre licensing, and so the NCBA can say, well, there's nothing licensed, and basically assume that everybody's going, well, okay, there's a end of discussion, nobody's using it, blah blah blah. But actually, there are numerous categories. Uh, where it is being used, and 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 the Missouri testimony has brought this out quite clearly. Uh, farmers are using it, and it's it's not on the label, and it's not you know it's in these special categories. So so you know an obvious question is well what's the big push? Why why suddenly is the is all this being pushed? Well it's because consumers pushed back against antibiotics. So the the antibiotic battle has been going on for four decades. Uh, as more and more people get, and as more antibiotic use, uh, you know, superbugs, MRSA, C. diff, uh, and, and as antibiotics, the medical community, we're losing our antibiotics, we're losing our antibiotics. Everybody's aware of this. And so the pushback in the consumer advocacy world against uh, uh, antibiotics in livestock 
has gotten you know pretty pretty enormous to the point where they've they're not outlawed but they're but they're they're not like they've been all right yeah. so the industry is desperate for a substitute because far be it from the industry to change the way they produce things and not you know raise them in you know uh, pathogen toxin um you know baths of, of concentrated animal feeding operations and so this is what so the substitution and the beauty from a, I'm think about this from a messaging standpoint you know Chick-fil-A or or Tyson or whatever hey we're not using antibiotics anymore <laughs> but uh, hey uh, we're using mRNA you know uh, of course they don't tell you that they just saying these are antibiotic free chickens antibiotic free um and so they got all this wonderful um you know message marketing message equity in the consumer um grocery basket when actually there's something deadlier coming along, which is mRNA. And, uh, and so right now, uh, there, there, there's a lot of, uh, whatever speculation. So I'm, I'm not going to speculate about, about whatever, uh, um, side effects, you know, uh, what's happening, but, um, but what we've seen from the mRNA jabs in COVID uh, it is certainly reasonable to think that many of those side effects will occur in livestock. And and one thing that we do know is that the mRNA does transfer genetically. So if you eat yes. a T-bone steak, uh, T-bone steak with the mRNA in it, you're going to have the mRNA. So those of us who have not gotten the jab because we didn't want the mRNA, uh, the question is, well, now am I going to get it the next time I go eat meat at Applebee's? Um, and, and one of the big, one of the big problems is that, that, um, that it doesn't have to be labeled. You remember, right. re remember, remember, uh, RBGH in, in milk and dairy. Yes. Do, do you know, RBGH came in as a, as a conditional, uh, trial thing. Yeah. And it was used extensively in dairy for eight years, eight years before it ever had to go on the label. And Isn't so that something it, it is, it is. So, so here we are in the you know, same boat crossing the same river um, uh, with, with the MRNA. And, and the, the, probably the worst part of the whole thing is that farmers and ranchers who go to the store and pick up a vaccine they don't know whether it's the old style or the mRNA because it's it's not it's not designated on the shelf. And that's the real tragedy. So right now, the only way to really protect yourself is to not use any vaccines on, uh, or or you know, if you're a farmer or rancher that you know it's the old style serum vaccine and not the mRNA. Um, but it it's it's again, it's it's a real, whatever confusing adulteration of our food system and um and the the watchdogs are asleep at the wheel and of course you know those of us who are fairly libertarian we don't expect the watchdogs to do anything anyway so it's not a surprise that it doesn't matter um but but it, it's it's just you know it's the same boat crossing the same river yeah and i what i find sad is how so many consumers because I think most people are good. I do believe that most of humanity are actually good. And we think that it would be labeled. You know, I was even having this discussion with my husband because we were talking about some different brands of products and he has some 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 favorites. And I said, I please don't buy this anymore because I genuinely do not want this in in our home. I don't feel comfortable with with any of us eating this. And and he said, well, what what would be wrong with this? Like, it's just a, a bread product. And I said, honey, it says right here on the label, it says made from bioengineered ingredients and that's GMO. And because he hadn't actually read the label, it's just been something that he grew up with and, you know, in his household for a long time. I mean, he was genuinely shocked. He, you know, and I said, they're not, they're putting it on the labels now. They're not saying GMO, they're saying bioengineered, which bioengineered. means the same thing. But I said, we, you cannot sadly, we cannot assume that anything that is big, big, large, you know, agriculture, that type of thing, you cannot assume that it's being done safely or even ethically anymore. I don't feel. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think I think your point there is is well made and we don't make it enough in that that as you as you scale up, as you get 
uh, higher and higher on that industrial scale, the chances of integrity are are less and less and less. Uh, I mean, I, I've kind of come to the conclusion, uh, whatever, if, if there's anything big enough to be advertised on TV, you probably shouldn't buy it. I mean, that, that like it, that becomes a little, a little bit of a litmus test for me. You know, if you can afford TV advertising, eh, that's probably, you know, uh, uh, bigger than you want to uh, deal with. And, and to make another point on that organics, organic certification has never, they've never, uh, uh, made a point of vaccination, even the old style vaccination, uh, organics has stayed out of the vaccination, whatever vaccination debate from mm -hmm. day one, uh, organic certification has never, uh, uh, taken a position on vaccination and guess what? They're sitting this one out as well. And so you can't just say, well, this is organic certified. So I'm sure it doesn't have an MRNA. And no, that's, that, that's not true at all. Uh, so the, the organic certification doesn't protect you. So, you know, so we're back to know your farmer, know your food. Uh, and we're also back to a brand new marketing opportunity for small scale producers who are true blue and um, and and often uh, have a habitat for their animals that does make the animals healthier because they're not at scale. They're not, you know, they're, they're not um, stressed. I mean, a lot of them, uh, they have names, you know, um, even though they're going to slaughter, you know, they still have the, you know, uh, the calf has a name. And, yeah. uh, and, and so that, that, that's the difference. Yeah. So I was I'm curious and, and wanted to ask you, Joel, because we do not vaccinate our herd. And when I grew, grew up on a small cattle farm, uh, my dad ran at, probably at the height uh, when I was a old preteen, early teenager, he ran about 130 head of cattle um, and never vaccinated ever. And he still has part of that small herd. And the only time we never used vaccines, we had one calf that was in the birth canal too, too long was a first time mom. She had trouble birthing and he ended up swallowing, uh, you know, some of his own feces in the birth canal type deal and got sick. And so we did have to do one dose of antibiotics with him, um, or let him die. And I felt that I would rather give him a dose of antibiotics and, and go forth. So we've never right. vaccinated, um, any, any cows in our herds. My dad's herd never did either and never, ever had an issue, um, with losing them to anything. So as far as you know, vaccines and health. I'm, and of course we did grass fed, you know, grass finished. They were all out on, on pasture. It was not feedlot type conditions. So they were yeah. healthy, but I, you know, so, because I, I hear, you know, there's this big, you know, kind of pushback or like, well, so only, you know, we do this to keep them healthy and, and da, 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 da. Mm. But I have to say like, we've had cattle for mm. thousands and thousands of years and they have survived just fine without vaccines. Uh, yeah. So I'm curious, have, do you, do you guys ever use vaccines in any shape or farm form no, on your guys' no. farm? No, we, we never, we never use vaccines and we, we have, we have a thousand head of cattle. So we're not, we're not a backyard operation. You know, we have a lots, lots of animals uh, and we never use vaccines. Now um, uh, have we ever, um, yes, we've used vaccines twice in, as I recall in my memory, um, one, and I'll, I'll give you both instances and you can, and, and you can see how, um, this, this is kind of a, a broader discussion, but, but every time we've had a sickness, it's always been our fault. It, it, it but there aren't some, there aren't some, you know, nefarious sickness fairies up in the, you know, up in the heavens, uh, saying, Oh, I'll pick, I'll pick farmer, you know, uh, John over there and we'll sprinkle some, you know, some uh, sickness dust down on his place. No, no, no. There's always a reason. And uh, so the two times we used vaccines back uh, many, many years ago, one, we had leased a new property and it was full of blackberries. I mean, acres and acres, it had been neglected for a long time. It was acres and acres of blackberries. And the landowner was one of these real, you know, greeny, greeny environmentalists. He didn't, he didn't want to, uh, to mow the blackberries because that's where rabbits live and, you know, robins live in there and that sort of thing. And so we said, well, what are we going to do about these? So, you know, we, we conspired, you know, here, how do we get rid of these blackberries without mowing them? So we said, oh, we'll put, we'll put the mineral box up in there. You know, we'll just shove that mineral box in there and the calves will tromp them out and, you know, and we'll, we'll eventually get rid of the blackberries. 
So we started doing that. We were there about a week and for, first time we'd never been there. And we had about, I don't know, 80 cabs or so, uh, you know, stalker cabs, weaned cabs. I mean, these were, you know, 700, 700 pound cabs. And um, we were there a week and suddenly we lost one. Well, you don't lose very many of those kind of cabs. You know, that that's kind of, it's one thing to lose a chicken. I mean, everybody loses a chicken, but, but, you know, to lose a, to lose a seven, 800 pound calf is that kind of gets your attention. And, um, and next day I lost another one. Next day I lost two. Well, now I'm panicking, you know, my goodness, we lost four. Uh, right. So I call the vet, I call the vet, the vet comes right over and, um, we go up to one of the dead ones. He takes his little razor blade out, whacks into the, into the leg, black leg. Ooh. which is a which is a a common uh, uh malady and everybody around here vaccinates for black leg i mean it's that dreaded that horrible dreaded you know thing and um so uh, he said he said the only way i know to get ahead of it is to vaccinate him so boy we got him in the next day we vaccinated and sure enough it stopped it right now okay so um so you know I, i'm I'm not a vaccine naysayer, you know, the vaccines don't work or that, that there's some sort of, you know, horrendous, uh, I'm, 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 you know, I'm not quite to that level. Um, but it didn't sell well with me. Why, if, you know, all of a sudden we need to vaccinate. I don't like this, you know, what's the deal. So one of the, you see right behind me, you see all these books back here. One of the things that uh, I do is collect old ag books like pre-1940 ag books i got a whole shelf full of them so i went to the shelf with all the the beef cattle section well, let's look at what it says about black leg so i'm looking through all these early books about black leg and of course it's all you know vaccinate 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 and i'm really getting discouraged i get the last book the last one and the last sentence says uh, a ubiquitous soil-borne protozoa that generally enters the body in anaerobic puncture wounds, generally created by berries and brambles and thorn bushes. Wow. Oh, there was the answer. Uh, was <laughs> Those the blackberries. Answer. Yeah. We, we, we turned these, we turned these calves into pin cushions and, oh. and, 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 and did it so aggressively. The poor things we, we overrode their immune system. We overrode yeah. their ability to, to, to handle this. And so, you know, I went with that to the to the landlord. I said, "Look, you know, here's the deal. We lost these cattle." He said, "Oh, well, then go ahead and mow the blackberries." So we mowed them down with a bush hog. Never vaccinated, and never had another one, and it's been you know, ten years, and never had another one. So that's the one story. The second story was about chickens. So we had had this flock of chickens, and um, and and a lady had called us and asked us to raise her. I think it was three hundred, maybe four hundred pullets. She didn't feel comfortable raising from chicks. She said, could, could you raise them up till they, you know, get to be start to lay? I'll come and get them and then I'll have my, you know, ready to lay my, my flock. Okay. Uh, we're always looking for, you know, new ways to earn a buck, right? So, so we, okay, we'll raise them for you. So we raised them up. They get to be, uh, you know, four and a half months. I call her up and say, hey, you know, the birds are about ready to lay. You want to come pick them up? Oh, well, I've changed my mind. I don't want them. Well, suddenly, oh. <laughs> yeah. Suddenly we had all these chickens. We didn't have a a, a a place to put them. It was early spring. It wasn't really time to go out in the field with them. We hadn't planned on that. Make a long story short, we we you know, we had new chicks coming for our broiler, our broiler, our meat production uh, thing. So we had to get them out. And so I took them took them out to the field, and we had ten days of forty degree drizzly, just horrendous weather, rain. The chickens couldn't get comfortable. They were stressed. They were, you know, they were wet and they came down with Merrick's disease. Now, Merrick's disease, if you look at, if you look at the poultry books, it's a fairly, it, it, it's not an aggressive virus. It's, it's a respiratory uh, virus. Um, and of course it says, you know, it comes from stressful, unsanitary, unhygienic conditions. And that's exactly what we've done. And, um, and and so it is a, a fairly gentle you know gentle virus um and but but it do, it does hang around and and um and so we we vaccinated i think for two years maybe three just till we were it, it, it said if you'll vaccinate for two or three years and don't have any of it then within three years you know you're, you're out of the woods 
And so we did that, never had another issue, and have never had another issue since, and it's been 20 years. So so I, I relate those stories partly to to be vulnerable and say, hey, you know, we're not perfect. We've had our things. But to also encourage folks to realize when you have sickness, serious sickness, it's always something you're doing in management, always. Um, now, it could be that you have weak genetics, you know, that you got the wrong animal. That could be too. But but uh, but but nature's default position, where where nature wants to go, is toward is is wellness. That's where nature wants to go. And if there's not wellness, then probably I did something to you know to interfere with the immune system or some. And it's a it's all that that. that we don't have to buy on these crutches. We don't have to use these things if we actually practice really good, stress-free, sanitary hygiene in our lifestyle. Yeah. Well, and I'm glad that we had this part of the discussion too, because I'm with you. I am not anti, you know, using medication where needed and even vaccines if needed, but right. I am anti just blanket. We're going to dose everything from the right. get-go to, you know, in case of every every possible thing, just this overuse of all of those things. Um, but there is where you have to look at the exact situation and what's, you know, happening with your animals and, and make some judgment calls there. And sometimes that does require using modern medicine. Sure. Um, sure. And I'm with you. I, I don't think that there's anything wrong with that either. Um, but just doing so in moderation and having a true understanding of, like you said, why did I need to use those? What happened and how can I correct this for the future so that I don't have to use these things and, you know, make sure that the animal's in its best state possible. And right. so I think it's really good because I know a lot of times folks, especially when you're new, uh, you really want to do everything just right. I think we all feel that way. We all want to do everything just right, sure. but also understanding that that can sometimes be difficult and you will make mistakes. We all have. And it's okay to use the modern things that we have um, in certain instances that, that it's not, it doesn't have to be all or nothing, um, which is one of the things that I think we are seeing more and more people. I know myself, as I saw the rise of, you know, uh, GMOs in our food and had my own health story. And when I cut those out, I had healing. And so for me, it was proof of my body that I wanted to stay away from those types of things. And so I'm also taking that stance personally with the mRNA. I am not, I'm not convinced that we have shown proven safety. I think we're way too early and I'm not willing to be a guinea pig. So mm -hmm. therefore I am not using it in the animals. I don't want to consume any products that are using that. And, you know, for those who are watching this, if you're okay with that, then that's totally fine. I just think where we should have complete transparency and no if we are consuming something that has that on it. Um, I think that that's, that's fair and right. Um, doesn't mean that that's what's going to happen. Thankfully, there's some, some things that are happening so that we have clear labeling, which I think is really important. And then folks can choose which route they want to go. But I do think that we're going to see more folks who are choosing to opt out of having food that has those types of things in it. And sometimes the only way to know that is like you and I is to actually talk to the farm directly, talk to the people who are raising the food and ask, what are you using? Do you vaccinate? If so, what vaccine, you know, that whole route. Um, and so I know a lot of smaller homesteads, which um, I would consider myself because my herd is nowhere near the size of your guys is when you only have say maybe, you know, a half a beef, maybe you're raising a beef a year and your family needs half. And then you've got this other half, or maybe you're, you know, raising a couple beef a year, um, or maybe it's chickens, maybe it's pork, et cetera, but you don't have this huge marketing budget. Um, so some avenues for folks to be able to find the people who are searching out this mm -hmm. food that's raised in this manner um, and be able to reach them and to be able to sell it so that they can be profitable and continue raising animals in this manner. Um, and also keep you know their food when it's done this way. The beautiful thing is it's local and it's community. And there's some really great relationships that happen when we do that, that benefit uh, more than just eating healthy meat. So Joel, I know you have implemented a lot of programs and have um, just a, a wonderful, we could probably talk for two or three hours on this topic alone, but I would love for us to give some tangible tips to people so that if they are raising or on the flip side, you're not able to raise it, but you're like, I want to seek out a source. How do I find these folks? How do I find this type of meat? 
Yeah, great. So, so yeah, um, uh, I think the umbrella uh, around this discussion, Melissa, is that um, that this is this whole mRNA thing is just another. Uh, I call it the drip on the head. Um, that, that, that's 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 encouraging people to get homesteads and, and to get out and raise it. There's nothing like seeing your animal out in your own back pasture. You know where it came from. You know what's in it. You know you know what's there. And so it's driving this. So in my experience, I, I kind of have a a, a little uh, uh, whatever a, a list of what almost anybody in a, in in Americans can sell what I call off the back stoop. Um, so, so my first encouragement is to be encouraged. Don't be intimidated by this. Almost everybody can sell two beef, five hogs, and a hundred chickens, and about and about ten to twenty dozen eggs a week off their back stoop. So, so th- in other words, this is no advertising, no social media, no no special. So, unless you're a hermit, <laughs> and there are homesteaders who are hermits. Amen. But, but 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 unless you're a hermit, you, you know you're circulating somewhere. You you might be going to a job. You might have coworkers. Even if even if you're not going to work, uh, you've got coworkers. You know on the internet and um, in, in your company, you've got uh, you've got people at church. There are people uh, in your you know maybe the kids are in 4-H or some uh, soccer or ballet or or whatever. Some you know something where. where Places where you circulate, just start dropping the idea, you know, we have a beef, uh, we have a couple of hogs, we have, you know, we're raising some chickens. And uh, in, in most circles today, unless people are completely, you know, out to lunch, um, that piques people's interest. And then, you know, then you're going to have another, another conversation. Um, and, and so, so simply view your regular goings where you're going every day, uh, and people you get in contact with just, uh, realize they eat too. And many of them are actually, they're actually struggling for a source and you don't even know it, but they, uh, they're actually wanting not to buy from Walmart, but nobody's ever come up to them and say, and said, you don't have to, you know, you can get it from me. And so uh, this isn't about being pushy. It's not about pushing yourself on somebody. It's about realizing there are, uh, for every person who actually does buy with intention, there are three or four who would like to, and either don't know how, don't have the courage to, too lazy to, whatever, okay? And so view yourself as as giving all of those people now an opportunity breaking down their barriers that have never been broken down. I, I'm talking about you, you, you need to be able to be happy with emotionally, mentally and emotionally and psychologically that you're not, you haven't turned into some sort of used car salesman. Um, and I don't dislike used car salesmen. I mean, they're just a stereotype, right? Pushy and sign now. And, you know, um, or, 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 you know, the, 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 if, if you ever called for a, for a TV commercial, you know, but wait right now, you know, uh, you can get the next. So, so th- that, that's one thing, uh, realize that you're, you're serving somebody else and, and chances are that person that you're just having a spontaneous conversation with is as lost as you were five years ago. And you can make their day by by making it easy for them to do something they've been wanting to do for a long time and haven't. The second thing I would say is don't don't feel like uh, it all has to be done at once. Um, uh, you know, okay, so maybe you raised four pigs and you're going to eat one, you want to sell three, okay? Well, that's fine, but don't, don't sit here and say, well, I got to sell three pigs. Just say, I got to sell half a pig, break it down to where it's an increment small enough that you can sell. If you need to sell a whole beef, well, think about four quarters and, and, and can you move, can you move a quarter of that beef uh, to, to somebody that's a lot cheaper 
and uh, and 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 chances are you can find four people willing to spend eight hundred dollars easier than one person willing to spend three thousand. Okay, and and so you can you know um, get it down into small enough bites that you're not intimidated by how much you got to by how how many uh, you've got to move at one time. And, um, you know, when I do marketing courses, I always tell people, um, always start with one. Don't, don't even say, well, you know, to make this business successful, we got to sell a hundred. No, 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 no. You, you won't ever get started because it's too intimidating. Just say, you know, Beth, let's just sell one, you know, and, and, and if you can sell one, you can sell two. And everyone will become easier. You'll hone your message. You'll get better at, you know, at, at, at the, whatever the, 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 the click buttons, you know, what, what, what's the catalyst that turns people on and, and, and you'll get better at it. So start with one, uh, that's real critical. So you're not intimidated. Yeah. I, it's kind of that old adage, right? How do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? <laughs> one bite at a time. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. And I'm going to get a little bit nitty gritty here just because when we first started selling, um, you know, it was mainly just like you said, it was to coworkers because they would just hear me go on and on about grass fed beef and how great it was. And then they would just naturally ask and they'd be like, well, do like, do you raise any for anybody else? Do you have any extra? And so that was um, just a very way to naturally open the door. So exactly as you said, just kind of be an evangelist out there and people will ask if they're interested. They'll start to ask those questions and and you can move forward without being uh, slimy or feeling that way. Right. Um, but one of the things that this was new to me because I had grown up where my dad, same thing, we, he had raised the, you know, the cattle and he'd sell extra half. Most people bought a half a beef or, or a quarter. Very few actually bought a whole. And so he was always just, you know, if you said you were going to buy the beef, then we took you at your word. We told you how much it was per pound when the, the butcher came and we had our exact weight. We told you, you paid us. And then you went and got your cut and wrap, picked it up from the butcher. So that was just very, very normal operations. And so that's how we did it. And of course, most of it was coworkers. But as we have, have started to grow, we've had people that have, you know, heard up from word of mouth and whatnot in our area. And luckily I've never gotten burned, <laughs> but I have had where it came down to it. And it was the actual day for them to pick up and to pay. And they said, well, I can actually only afford to pay you half today. Well, I don't necessarily have that much extra room in my own freezer to be taking, you know, these beefs that people said they wanted and, and holding them until they can, can do it. So we are now this year are going to be implementing where we're going to require a down deposit of a certain amount. Um, for people that are not current customers or not well, you know, that we don't know really well that aren't like part of our church that we've known for a long time. So is that something that that you guys do or is that something that you recommend when it's, you know, larger than just a whole chicken or something like that with beef? Is that a practice that you guys have used? Yeah, uh, we, we certainly we certainly did early on. We don't do it anymore um, because we just, you know, we... Um, most even even our quarters and halves are volume bulk sales. So what we found and realized, you know, we're we're selling three three hundred beef a year. So you know, that's this big. Is, yeah, yeah, it's it's a lot. It's, it's a lot of critters. Um, and and um, we've been in it a long, long time. And just like you have these memories of the old days where uh, people would get a quarter or a half. Um, you know, we do too. That, that's the way people used to, that, that was the only way we used to sell it a long time ago. But we've watched this, this um, erosion of culinary understanding mm -hmm. uh, increase uh, and, 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 and ignorance increases. And so more and more of our people don't want to talk to the butcher because they're intimidated by a butcher. You know, he wears bloody, bloody aprons. Uh, carries a cleaver on his belt. He's gruff. Uh, the butcher typically doesn't want to talk to him um, because he's busy and he's got to, you know, wipe off his hands and get the phone, get an ink pen and a paper. And well, you want that? You want that uh, T-bone three quarters or, or uh, you know, uh, half inch thing? You know, well, oh, well, what what do you what do you suggest? Oh, you know, come on. And and these butchers get really gruff about that. So. We started um, back, oh goodness, uh, 10, 12, 15 years ago, we pretty much quit the butcher routine and we now make four basic uh, packages, a quarter of beef each, one is bony, 
One is boneless. They all have names. You know, one's the slow cooker's dream. One's uh, all American country club. One's, you know, just all American. And, and, and so these are four standard cuts uh, packages and, and you can, and, and you can just, you can just order, you order that standard one. Now, if you really want to get it custom cut and get talk to the butcher, you can still do that. But very, very few people do that anymore. They'd rather us make all of those decisions. They don't want to talk to the butcher. They just come and 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 we cut it. Uh, we have it, you know, again, we have a couple of different cuts and mm -hmm. they can just come and, and get the box. Because the other thing that that eliminates is, and I'm sure you've dealt with this. So you, you sell it by the hanging weight. Right. You cut it up. And they call and say, we took this up to the bathroom scales and your invoice said it was, it was uh, 180 pounds and the scales say it's 100 and 145. What happened to my meat? Well, you know, you got bone loss, you got trim, you got stuff and, and you got all this. And of course, you know, everybody accuses their butcher of stealing meat from them. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, everyone in the country, everyone. And so, so the beauty of this is we, we cut it to, we, we have five basic uh, cut packages. It goes in a box. They have different prices. Obviously the, the bony stuff uh, is cheaper and the, the boneless stuff is more expensive. And, and, uh, and we, you know, they come in, we weigh the box, they pay us. And guess what? It weighs the same on the bathroom scale as it did on our scale. And, and that eliminates all of that, that conjecture and perceptions and, and, and whatever, um, ten, tense discussions. And, you know, you're trying to build trust and they have every reason now to not trust us. And, you know, it just, it just goes ahead. So, so sometimes more is less. We actually learned that from our guy who ran our delivery truck for 15 years and then retired, uh, big, big Richard and uh, great, great big guy. He was in the IT business. He came to us and started dri driving our delivery truck just because he wanted to get out of the city and, and have a better lifestyle, took a big pay cut, but he had, but he was doing something that he loved. And, um, uh, and he was in the IT business and his business, uh, made customized, uh, so, some sort of customized platform for all these, uh, for all these people. And, um, and so one of them suggested in a business meeting, he said, said, let's quit customizing everything. It takes us all this time. Let's offer about four different, uh, platforms, take it or leave it. They did that. And sales doubled in a year. Why? Because people didn't have to make all the decisions. People are over decisioned right now. That's why subscription sales and all that, that's why they're so hot because people, I mean, people don't even want to have to decide, do I need toilet paper this week? They just subscribe to the toilet paper on Amazon, comes to the front door. I don't have to decide that. People are so hurried and harried and smart phoned out and video gamed to, 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 to helter skelter that they're desperate to not have to make more decisions. And so, uh, so if we can, if we can make it so that they don't have to, all they have to do is say yes and not make any other decisions, you know, on how many T-bones to put in a package, how big to make the rebuys. Do I have bone in, bone out? How right. big do I make my, my ground beef? Do I want 70, 30, 80, 20? You know, all those kinds of things. We take all that guesswork out and, and suddenly they love us. They love us because it's easy. Well, you've given me some ideas there. See, that's why I love our conversations. Every time I get some great takeaways from you. So where we're at in Washington State right now is I'm allowed to sell it as a whole half or quarter uh, because they're picking it up from the butcher. He's doing on-site slaughter and then he takes it and does it. But what, so I, they have to actually pick it up from him. I can't pick it up from them and then redistribute it to them with our with our current uh licensing and setup and everything. However, I could offer these four cut and wrap packages. You pick which one is right for you. And then I just turn that into the butcher for them and eliminate what you're saying, all of that kind of, and then they could just say, that's the one I want. And then I you're, just submit it for them. Let me tell you, Melissa, your butcher, your butcher will smother you with kisses 
when you come to him with that idea. Believe me, that's been our experience because they don't want to talk to our urban ignorant customers. We we love our ur- urban ignorant customers. Okay, we love them. The butcher doesn't. Okay, yeah. and we're not using ignorant as like derogatory. It just it's something no, no, that no, you don't have no. knowledge about. I don't want anybody to take that right. out of context. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, it's not. No, a, no, no, yeah. no. Uh, maybe I should say novice. Okay, or or you know uh, less informed, whatever. But but listen, if you, I mean, I mean if if you haven't made these kind of decisions, I mean, does your average customer know where a rump roast comes from versus a Delmonico steak? I mean, you know, you you and I have these meat charts on our desks, right? And we we kind of know, and, and we actually hold our well shoulders up here, and you know, we have do a pig. P- pig's real easy, you know, bacon, ribs, you know, ham, you know. And we we hold our body, right? Um, but 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 our 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 wonderful wonderful urban customers don't think like that. That's not their world. Okay, yeah. so. We need to simplify their world and we need to decomplicate our butcher's world because what we're doing is we're pushing our butcher into interfacing with our customers. He doesn't want to talk to them. They don't want to talk to him. And we're really complicating our interface by, by throwing that in. So yes, if your customers pick their package and you go down to the butcher and say, I want I want uh, four quarters cut like this, eight quarters cut like this, 10 quarters cut like this, and your customers can just grab those, man, er- everybody's happy. A- a- and you'll you'll see sales. You'll trust me, when we did this, our volume sales doubled in a year. Wow. It, it, it was it was unbelievable. It was unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, that really speaks, though, to decision fatigue as well. And as a society yeah. now, you know, with, with the Internet, which I love because it's how I we're able to connect and, sure, and sure. To, to be able to share so much information and to help people. But it does create decision fatigue, I think, at a level that we probably as society have, have never yeah. really experienced before in the in the history of time. And so you're right. Anything that you can do to make someone's life easier is going right. to get you that much closer to the sale and a customer who keeps coming back. Right. Right. Have you, have you seen the, uh, the marketing book, the paradox of choice? Have you no, seen that book? I it's haven't a, read that. It's, it's a wonderful book. It's the title is the paradox of choice. Okay. And, and it's exactly what you just said. It's, it's the, 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 that, I mean, think back, think back 200 years ago, how many, how many choices did Laura Ingalls Wilder have when she wanted to, to make a dress? Or, or buy it. She she didn't have very many choices. Okay, um, but but today we have we have every we're just inundated with choice, and, and so what happens is so what happens is you it's a paradox or paralysis. I think it's paradox. But 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 anyway, you, you get the idea. You, if you have too much choice, you actually you actually um, uh, almost shut down mm-hmm. because. Ah, you know, it, it, it's it's too much, and so uh, so what I'm talking about is is uh, is a real advantage. Yeah. Well, hey, I'm super excited because now I have to sit down and figure out what my four cut choices are <laughs> sure. and what I'm going to call them. But I'm really I'm really excited actually for this. I think that's going to be great. And I mean, there's so much more obviously to go into. I mean, we just barely were able to to just hop on the surface of that. But I know one of your talks coming up very shortly at the Modern Homesteading Conference in Idaho this June 30th and July 1st, uh, one of your talks is actually going to be talking about, um, you know, profitable homesteading and how to more safely navigate being a smaller homestead where you're not going to be licensed and not going through all of the things that larger places do, but how do you protect yourself and also be able to sell stuff and to do so where you're making money and all of that. So if this was of interest to you, you guys are not going to want to miss that presentation that Joel does, which will be on Saturday will be July 1st, the second day of the conference. Um, But Joel, thank you so much for coming on. It's always a pleasure. And like I said, I always learn something something new. So I might just have to have you on a little more regularly um, because I'll just need to pick your brain on more things. 
<laughs> All right. Well, I'm, I'm delighted to do it, Melissa. It's great, great to visit with you. And I'm looking forward to being with you out there too. I'm, I'm just thrilled that this, um, uh, th th this theme is coming to the Northwest. I think it's ripe. Uh, Northwest is ripe for picking too often. It gets excluded to the, to the exclusion, you know, to Tennessee, Kentucky, and, and North Carolina. And, you know, there's a lot going on uh, down here in the mid Atlantic region. Um, and so I'm, I'm delighted to partner with you there in, uh, in the Northwest. Yeah, same. We're super excited. Well, thank you, sir. And I'll see you soon. Okay. Thanks, Melissa. Well, I hope that you enjoyed that interview as much as I did and got some of those nuggets. I am super intrigued to try this technique out and sit down and come up with my different cut and wrap offers that will be available to our customers. And if you are in the Western Washington area or are willing to travel to our butcher, which is in Stanwood, Washington, is the butcher where you would actually be picking it up. I do believe that we may have an extra quarter grass-fed, grass-finished beef available, and the it would be in September. So we will have a link where you can get on a notification list as we have things like that come available. So I'll make sure and put that in the blog post as well. So you can hop on that if that is something that you guys are interested in. So on to our verse of the week. Oops, <laughs> knocking over stuff here as I pick up my Bible. And we are in Psalm 104. And we are at verse, where am I at here? Uh, verse 14, Psalm 104, verse 14. And this is the amplified translation of the Bible. He causes vegetation to grow for the cattle and all that the earth produces for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food out of the earth. Now, if that isn't a verse written for a farmer or a homesteader, I don't know what is. But I wanted to share that because obviously in the context of what today's episode was about, right, we were talking primarily about cattle, though there was some other livestock involved there. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because I have worked as a pharmacy technician. I worked as a pharmacy tech for 18 years in pharmacy. I have been a farmer. I am a farmer, right? Uh, I also worked as a barista. So those of you who've been hanging out with me for any any amount of time know my absolute love of coffee. And if you've never had a brevet and we are together, I will introduce you to a brevet because I happen to think a brevet is the best, most delicious coffee drink that ever existed that is out there. From all the different jobs that I have had and done over the years, and there's been a lot more than that, but those are kind of the, the main ones. There is something about being outside and growing food and having your hands in the dirt and pruning the trees and tending the cattle or the pigs or the chickens. You know, we raise, raise all of those and have at different times. But it is a very different feeling overall, I have to say, and the satisfaction and the way you feel at the end of the day doing that type of work versus being a, a pharmacy tech and inside. And I'm not, I'm not throwing any shade on those things whatsoever, but I have to say when I, and there've been hard days of farming where I've been like, oh man, I really wish I was working in an air conditioned building, or I wish I was working in a heated building because it is laborious, right? Tending, tending the earth and taking care of living animals, et cetera. There are some real hard days, and I've shared some of those videos with you, like when we lost our, our milk cow clover earlier this year. There are some definite hard times. I mean, even this morning I was uh, sharing with Joel, I was getting ready uh, to, to prepare for our interview and to do some things, and I have a knock on the door, and my cows got out last night. We had a dry uh, thunderstorm and lightning that ran through, and we've got cottonwoods and when it gets windy, them things like to come down on fence lines and the dry lightning spooked the cattle. And so my cows were out. So I had to drop everything, go find the cows. And luckily the little stinkers were literally standing at the gate, waiting for me to open it, to let them into the field. They're like, Oh, we've been out all night. We kind of would like some breakfast. Just let us back in. Here we are, which was great. Cause I have, um, had to go hunt up cattle who have gotten out before and spent two hours trying to round them back to the pasture. So I was quite grateful that these guys were ready to come to come back in. So it's something that you're always having to deal with and sometimes often unexpectedly, not always fun. 
But there is something I, I have always felt closer to God and more fulfilled with the work of growing food and tending to livestock and being part of that whole circle. And I think it has to do with obviously being a good steward and anything that we're doing, even if you are a, what like as a pharmacy tech, you know, whatever your, your occupation may be, uh, we are to do it as unto the Lord, right? As to a service to him, no matter what it is we're doing. But there's something different, I feel, a, a different level. And maybe it's just me. I would love to hear from you guys in the comment section if you're watching this on YouTube. But when I am gardening and taking care of animals and just all of those things, being a good steward and trying to do the very best that I can, I feel fulfilled even when I'm more tired than the days when I was, you know, working at the pharmacy and doing some of those other things. I mean, being literally exhausted at the end of the day. But I feel more fulfilled and a deep knowing that that is what I am supposed to be doing. And so when I read this verse, it makes sense, right? Because this is what he causes his pur his purpose for us is for us to cultivate the earth that we may bring forth food out of the earth. And we think sometimes of as, as a farmer or a gardener or whatnot, right? Like we think of that as being humble. And I tell you, nothing has humbled me like being a farmer or a gardener. So that is true. But sometimes I, th I think that in maybe more modern society, like you look down like, oh, that's just a, a dumb farmer, you know, that type of thing, um, which is completely untrue. Um, if you've never farmed or gardened anything before, you will quickly learn that people who've been doing it for a while are quite smart because it is actually quite harder than it looks from the outset. And I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, but I think that's why so many of us feel called to come back to this and feel that it's just like you know that you are doing what you were supposed to be doing. At least that's how I feel, even on the hard days. And so when I read this verse, I'm like, yes, yes, because that is what God has called us to do. It is part of his design. And for many of us, we're getting back to that in a way, in a manner that we haven't before or on a deep, deeper level, you know, doing more of it. And of course it makes sense because Right here it is in the verse. So sometimes it's just really good to feel where you find confirmation. And I feel like that's what one of these verses are, is, is confirmation that this is the right thing. And of course, that is why it feels so right and so good. And also to hold that confirmation for the days when things don't feel quite so rainbow and sunshine, because those days will come too. But to hold that verse close um, and to kind of embrace and meditate on that. So I leave that with you. And if you have not grabbed your tickets to the Modern Home Setting Conference, you can go and get those. They are still on sale at modernhomesetting.com. And we would love to see you at this year's event. So blessings and mason jars for now, my friend. And I will be back here with you next week. <laughs>